how that's me. 53 years ago, I just made PFC at a boot camp and I had my orders to go to my first duty station, which was Kaneohe Bay, Marine Corps Base, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines. And that's me at Camp Geiger waiting to get on the bus. These are some of my friends that went along with me. We were all excited, waiting for that first plane ride. A lot of us never uh, flew before. And when we got on the plane, uh, it was kind of a bumpy ride. We were still excited. And we all got airsick. Even the stewardess got airsick on that flight. But we sang old folk songs and made it all away. We finally made it to Camp Pendleton, to the staging barracks, where we had to wait a few weeks to uh, get on board ship to go to Hawaii. Yeah, some of us had mess duty, some of us had guard duty. We finally got to go on Liberty, though. That, that was a picture of uh, Tijuana. I'll never forget the first tacos I ever ate was in Tijuana, Mexico. Yeah, they were good. I must eat a dozen of them until I found out they were made out of dog meat. Anyway, we finally made it back, and uh, here is uh, uh, the place where we were waiting to get on the bus to get on the ship. Oh, I had visions of what Hawaii was going to be like. You know, grass huts, beautiful girls playing with dolphins in the ocean. Well, I'd seen all the movies about the South Seas and that was in the back of my mind. So, that's what we were dreaming about. Yeah. This is where I learned uh, the old saying of hurry up and wait, because that's what we did. These are some more of my friends who were all waiting. That's uh, Private Donovan. He had duty that night before, so he got some shut-eye waiting for the bus. And we had time to fool around. That guy down there fixing to tackle me a good friend of mine. I'll tell you about him later. And uh, this is a picture of RC bags being loaded on that ship. Um, some of us even got sick just at the dock while the ship was still tied. And that's kind of the, what the ship looked like, I think. Uh, can't remember real well, you know, it was 53 years ago. But it was a, not a troop transport, but a, a transport ship. Anyway, it got off to be a bumpy ride. And just like the picture shows, we started to get seasick. Well, we fold around some, but as you can see behind uh, uh, Tom there, we're all getting sick. Tom got sick. I got sick. Most of us got seasick on that trip. That's uh, Private Count Kavatika. I think that's the way to say his name. I was standing on his chest at the time. And this is the first time I ever saw a flying fish. And there they were. Most of the time, most of the trip, this is what we saw, the ocean. It was vast and it was all around us. And it was the farthest I'd ever been away. Finally, we saw Diamond Head. That was a beautiful sight that morning. We watched as it got closer and closer. And I don't think I will ever forget what Diamond Head looked like that day. All the Marines went to the side of the ship and watched as we pulled into Pearl Harbor. That's it in the distance. And there it is up close. Soon we were going to offload that ship 
head to our duty stations. That was an exciting time. Then I got a chance to take a picture of the Arizona Memorial. I accidentally had a double exposure of a palm tree. I kept that picture because somehow it just looked fitting. Well, this is a picture of the Pali. That's the mountain range cuts Oahu in half, north and south. And as we crossed the Pali, there it was. Second Battalion, Fourth Marines. That's our barracks. I was assigned to Echo Company, 2-4. I was an 0311 grunt and did a lot of training with Echo Company for the first few months. Although I was a PFC, I was still a junior man and did a lot of swabbing the decks. That's my friend, the Count. We did a lot of training in the bush outside of the barracks, outside of the base, I should say. That's a gunny we caught with his pants down. And we did a lot of swimming. Uh, Kenny always got some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. I wish I had their names. These are a lot of friends of mine that used to go to the beach with me. And this was taken at Makapu. We did a lot of body surfing at Makapu. The waves uh, got pretty high. We also did a lot of spear fishing, and that was fun. Of course, this is how we spent our liberty. A lot of the Marines didn't do that. They went into town and got drunk, and those guys didn't like uh, Hawaii at all. Here's another friend of mine. Uh, he taught me how to open a coconut, and that is not an easy trick. But there's a way. And you can see the coconut milk on the inside of that that he's holding, and that's me enjoying one. Those coconuts would just wash up on the beach. And we'd pick them up and enjoy ourselves. Tasted good. This picture was uh, taken by me standing on a, a little bridge that went over a creek in uh, Kaneohe. I'm looking back toward the barracks 2-4. When I first joined Echo Company, I learned about the Marine Corps Institute. These were MCI courses Marines could take. I think they still can to improve themselves, to learn skills that Marines need to know. It was a voluntary type thing. A lot of Marines didn't do it, but I did. Sometimes I took two at a time. Then in April 1964, there was an opening for the S-2 Scouts. Now the S-2 Scouts was made up of 12 men, three four-man teams. Most of them were corporals. The opening was offered for Lance Corporals and above. Now, I was only a PFC, but I wanted to be a scout. So I put in for it. And I took all the tests, physical and mental tests, interviews, and to my amazement, I made it. As a PFC in the Marine Corps, I was a scout, part of an elite unit that was known as the eyes and ears of the battalion. Now, I didn't always excel in my life. That didn't happen until after I became a Marine. I learned in boot camp that I could do anything I put my mind to. Uh, when I graduated from high school, out of a class of maybe 89, I was either 87 or 88. Just barely graduated, but I did graduate. Anyway, Marine Corps woke me up. I always admired those guys that were called scouts in the movies. You know, the ones that rode 
way out in front of the cavalry. That's where I wanted to be too. I admired my father who was in the cavalry before World War II and his grandfather that fought in the Civil War as a Union sergeant. Being called a scout was a great honor to me, especially in the Marine Corps. When I first joined the scouts, I was the most junior man in the outfit. That meant that just about everybody else could give me orders and they did. And just like every new guy that goes into a unit, uh, there were some jokes that they used to like to play, you know, like sending me down to supply to check out a TR double E for the comm shack and uh, going down to uh, the armory to check out a bag of back blast, things like that. Still, the greatest compliment I ever received was when I was compared to a corporal by the name of Cheeseboro. He used to say, oh, we got another Cheeseboro in the unit. Corporal Cheeseboro, unlike other Marines, would spend his off-duty hours studying MCI courses, uh, running the swamp, that was a uh, like three to five mile run, uh, going to the gym and working out. And when I joined the scouts, he had somebody to do all that with. As I said, the scouts were the eyes and ears of the battalion. Well, one of the things that made us the eyes and ears of the battalion was the ANTPS-21 ground surveillance radar. Uh, we called it uh, Tipsy 21. I became an operator of that radar machine. This is a picture of Corporal Emery. Uh, in today's terms, you might call him a geek. He was the one of the techs of that radar machine that taught me the ins and outs of how to use it. It looked a little like this. That's a 25, not a 21, but still, you get the general idea. Then in June 1964, Colonel J.R. Bull Fisher took command of the battalion from Lieutenant Colonel Doxey. I'll never forget the time that he came up to the microphone after he took command and he said, and I paraphrase these words, it's been my honor to serve with you 2-4 in combat. And it will again be my honor to serve with you 2-4 in combat. Now you magnificent bastards, who's the best in the Corps? Of course, we answered 2-4, but he said it again. He said, I said, who's the best in the Corps? Something came over us. We knew that we were on the way to being the best in the Corps. That was the very first time that we were called magnificent bastards. We didn't know exactly how to take that the first day, but after a while, that became a badge of honor and it was added to the battalion's logo. Oh, we had lots of training after that. This is a picture of an evasion. Now, this is a picture of what a POW camp might look like. We had escape and evasion school, went to it twice. Then I was promoted to Lance Corporal. Meritoriously, this is a picture of Bull Fisher at my award ceremony. And this is a picture of me uh, as a Lance Corporal the very first day. I was proud that day. And I was a magnificent bastard. 
Oh, we cross-trained with 3rd Recon Battalion, River Boat Training. Went to the field a lot and stayed dirty a lot. Lots of times we'd just walk into the shower with all our gear on and strip as we cleaned ourselves off of that Hawaiian mud. That's a picture of me coming off a long patrol. The waltzing Matilda was played the day the bull took over the battalion, and it became our theme song. Uh, this is Corporal Daniels. Uh, he got me involved in the Kaneohe Marine Skydivers when I became a Lance Corporal. And this is me coming down in one of my first jumps. This is a Marine jumping a paracommander. That was an experimental parachute at the time that uh, this picture was taken. Uh, I'm way out there. You can just barely see a little dot in the sky. I should be up here where the X is, but I'm not. I kind of missed the mark. This is uh, Lieutenant Peacock. You can see the uh, jumpsuit that we were issued. We were very proud to wear that. Now, this is Corporal Cove. He was not a member of the Skydivers, but he used to like to help us uh, fold our parachutes. That's Corporal Daniels, and he's folding his. This is a picture of one of the planes that we used to use. We also jumped out of helicopters, but we got a chance to see Hawaii like very few people did. And this is Waikiki in 1964. Now here's a picture of Diamond Head, the inside of which was a rifle range. Helicopters would uh, fly us up by the poly where we'd jump out, a little over 3,000 feet. I remember looking at the poly from Kaneohe, and some friends of mine and I decided one day we were going to climb it. So we got liberty, and we went to the top of the poly. Uh, that was some climb. The wind was blowing. I thought I was going to fall off. But when we got up there, we took a uh, C-ration can lid, scratched S2 scouts on it, and nailed it to the top of the poly. Once we got a chance to go to Kauai and train, which was a real treat, a friend of mine and I were camping out for several days actually and we decided to augment our sea rations with a little wild boar so that's what we did we went hunting I took uh, my K bar and tied it to the end of a stick and went out in the bush sure enough I found some scat and heard some noises and I found what I was looking for. It was the meanest looking wild boar I had ever seen in my life. Of course, I'd never seen one before, but still, she was pretty mean looking. And she wasn't real happy that we were there. So I, like a hunter, took my spear and threw it at her, and that just made her madder. So she proceeded to chase me up a tree by this huge canyon. Well, I had a beautiful view of the canyon, and my friend ran up the hill, and he uh, sat there and laughed at me as this wild boar was running around the bottom of the tree with her little piglets. Every now and then she bumped the tree with her tusks. When we got back, we had one story to tell. Well, as 
fun as that boar hunt was, that didn't even come close to what was gonna happen next to the whole battalion. One day I looked out and there he was, bigger in life, John Wayne standing there on the parade deck talking to Colonel Fisher. Next thing I knew, we were taken down to a place called Sandy Beach. It's down by Pearl Harbor. Taken into a Quonset hut and asked to put on different uniforms. Some were old World War II Marine uniforms and some were Navy uniforms. And one guy came over and said, hey, uh, why don't you go over there and put that uniform on? And it was a Navy uniform, so I did. Then he took me out and said, uh, okay, I want you to go over there and stand on the dock by that boat. Well, I did that. And then he said, now what I want you to do is act like a sailor and go in the boat and you'll know what to do. Just act normal. So I did that. And we went out the, to um, a seaplane, and out of the seaplane came John Wayne. Of course, in the boat was Kurt Douglas. And there I was, right along with those fellas. And when we came back in, I stood on the bow like I knew what I was doing with a line in my hand. And I jumped off onto the dock, tied the boat up, John Wayne jumped out of the boat with Kurt Douglas and they did their lines and believe it or not, that whole scene was in the movie. But the best part of that movie was not my part, but it was when Colonel Bull Fisher said his lines. What well, can't be all. That's all Captain Tory reports, sir. Three light cruisers and eight destroyers grouped with Captain Tory's heavy cruiser. None is equipped with radar. Twelve bat blind ships. Well, gentlemen, your opinions. We must position them to repel an invasion, sir. You mean wait, Admiral Broderick. Oh, we have no choice, sir. Wait. Seek out and destroy, if at all possible, sir. Seek out and destroy. Those words meant a lot to us in two form. We were the first ones to see that movie and the first ones to hear Bull Fisher say that famous line. And that stuck with us, especially when we went to Vietnam a few months later. After we were done with the movie, we continued to train and get ready for what was ahead. Oh, the official word was that we were to go to California, land at Camp Pendleton, and oh, just do some maneuvers. But the scouts were given French Vietnamese maps and told to study them inside and out. These were old maps that were used in Dien Bien Phu, 1954. So the declination diagram on the bottom was all wrong. And we had to figure all that out. Anyway, several months went past. And during this time, I had the opportunity to apply for Annapolis. I took uh, several tests two-year college equivalency tests and interviews. And I passed all the tests, except I was a little weak in math. And I was told that uh, I was accepted. But I had to go to New London, Connecticut and brush up on my math skills before I could attend Annapolis. Now, there was one other thing I had to do, and that was write a 200-word essay, uh, the subject of which, why I wanted to become an officer. Well, we had a lot of mount-out inspections and other inspections. 
these mount outs were uh, really um, very intense. We had to go outside, take all our gear, lay it on the ground and have it inspected. We did this over and over again. Then the scouts were allowed to go aboard ship. We went aboard ship as an advanced party. Now this ship was supposed to take us to California, but the scouts knew better. Don Johnson, my best friend, and I were sitting on this ship, still tied up at Pearl Harbor, and I was trying to write this bloody essay about why I wanted to be an officer. Well, Don looked up, he saw this young Navy uh, lieutenant come out and uh, did something rather stupid, and he looked at me and he said, are you sure you want to be an officer? Well, yes, I did want to be an officer. I did want to go to Annapolis. And my reasons were many. All my life, I'd been geared toward that goal. You see, my father and my mother were both in the Navy. My father was a lieutenant. My mother was one of the first waves. I had three brothers, and they were all in the Navy. And when I grew up, uh, I was in uniform from a very young age. I was a drummer boy in what was called the Washington Infantry in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Later on, I went to military school. And my father and mother made me a little uh, Navy uniform that I wore when my brother came home on leave one time. So I had really thought I was going to be a naval officer. So there I was sitting on this ship trying to figure out what to write. But I knew something else. I knew we were going to Vietnam and I knew that meant combat. And I did not want to leave 2-4, not at that time. So I took the blank piece of paper and I balled it up and I threw it in the Pearl Harbor and waited for the Colonel to arrive so I could tell him why I did not want to leave the battalion. That's exactly what I did. From there, the ship set sail and I stayed aboard. Instead of heading east toward California, the ship turned around and started heading west. That's when they came on the loudspeaker and told the whole battalion that we were going to Vietnam. But first, we were heading to Okinawa. The trip to Okinawa was relatively uneventful. The seas were calm. Now, we didn't have a lot to do except watch the beautiful ocean as it passed by. Uh, nobody really got seasick on this trip. Uh, we took care of our uh, grooming uh, and you know cleaned our rifles and the scouts continued to study those maps. And Finally, we made it to Okinawa. There we were taken to Camp Hansen. And in Camp Hansen, we cleaned our gear, checked our equipment, uh, did normal duties, you know, had what's called fire watch. That's a guy that walks around for four hours in the squad bay just to give him something to do at night. And uh, we went on Liberty. One of the things that did happen in Okinawa, though, was uh, the fact that uh, we had a, a Zippo lighter salesman come, al come along and, and uh, sell us all Zippo lighters. Now, these lighters were really nice, and they were relatively inexpensive. A lot of them had a Marine Corps emblem on it, but the one that I got had Two Fours logo 
on it. I wish I still had that lighter. Later on, it would prove invaluable. But uh, what we used them for in Okinawa was to light the cigarettes of the Nasons or the girls in the bars. I didn't smoke, but uh, I would pull out my Nason lighter and light this girl's cigarette and then, you know, put it back in my pocket. But it was a nice little thing. Anyway, we finally uh, was put back on board ship. And this time, we headed for Vietnam. The voyage from Okinawa to Vietnam was a whole lot different than the one we just experienced coming from Hawaii to Okinawa. The seas were rough. As a matter of fact, we ran into a typhoon on the way. I even saw an aircraft carrier sitting on a, a mountain of water and I saw the, the props on, on the uh, back of the carrier and I saw the bow and they were both out of the water. And when you see an aircraft carrier sitting on a mountain of ocean, you know it's rough. We even got into what we call a, a fishbowl where the sea all around you is higher than where you're sitting. And we popped up like a cork but even though it was rough, I enjoyed every minute of it. Oh, some of the Marines got seasick, and some of them uh, wouldn't get out of their hammocks or their racks down below. <laughs> what exactly a hammock, but it was a rack. Anyway, I loved to stay up on deck, and I did as much as I could because the ocean was... Oh, like I had always pictured the ocean to be on board one of those ships. And finally, we made it to Vietnam. Two days out, I had this picture taken of me. We were getting ready to be on the first landing craft to hit the beach at little place called Chulai. I remember standing on deck at night when we got to Vietnam, watching the horizon, and it looked like flashes of lightning, but we knew that it was naval gunfire, and we thought that they were softening up the beach for us to land, like they did in World War II. And then the day that we embarked off the side of that ship in those um, Mike boats to take us to Vietnam, the chaplain said a prayer and we thought for sure we were going to go right into a hot beach, full combat. And we were ready. And we had gone down the cargo nets into the mic boats and taken away from the ship. And we circled around uh, for a while until all the boats got together. Then on a signal, we all headed toward the beach. They told us to keep our heads down, not look over the edge of the mic boats uh, because we might get shot. So we did that. Then I saw the gunny motion to me to come up to the front of the boat, and he handed me a long pole, a wooden stick with uh, a three-sided sign on the top of it. He said, you carry this when we hit the beach, and I'll tell you where to put it. I said, gunny, you're giving me a stick to hit the beach with? You're going to arm me with a stick? He said, you just do what I told you. I said, okay. So we hit the beach finally, and I carried that stick. I also had a, a part of that uh, ANTPS uh, Tipsy 21. I think it was, I don't know, maybe the, the uh, bipod 
uh, part. Anyway, I had to carry it. And we were all wearing um, um, life vests over our flak jackets. And Vietnam is hot. And not just hot, it's very hot. And it was very hot on that day. And when we hit the beach, we were happy to get rid of those uh, life vests. But hitting the beach in Vietnam at July was a different experience than I expected. I thought we were gonna get shot at, you know, like they show Marines hitting the beach and like we had been trained for. But when we got on the beach, we looked up and up on a kind of a knoll was a big sign saying, welcome Marines. And here were these Vietnamese girls dressed in white with flowers and waving at us. And, and uh, there were newspaper reporters taking pictures. And I thought, well, this is really strange. So we finally uh, got together. All the scouts got together and we were told to uh, push on. And we did that. The sand around Chulai from there all the way to Route 1, which is a long way, was really, really soft. It was like, you know, you take a step forward and two steps back. Anybody that's been to the beach for any length of time know what I'm talking about. But when you're carrying several pounds of equipment and your rifle, you got a, a helmet and cartridge belt, wearing a flak jacket, that all weighs you down pretty good. I remember coming up to a, a, a hut that was built, had a little fence around it, and I had to check it out really for booby traps. And we finally made it past that. And then we came up to Route 1. Now, Route 1 in Vietnam was the only paved highway that I saw while I was there. And on Route 1, as we approached it, uh, there were thousands of Vietnamese all heading in one direction. They looked like they were carrying everything they owned. And indeed they were. They were all heading north. They were told that their villages and their little huts were no longer safe. So they were getting away. We had gone as far as we were supposed to go when we hit Route 1. You see, the Battalion 2-4 had what was called a tactical area of responsibility. This was a line drawn on a map that gave us an area that we were responsible for. It was a large area. And in the center of it was where the command post was. And that was very close to where I was standing on Route 1. Of course, next to Route 1 was a railroad track that ran north and south. And um, so we crossed the tracks and went into the jungle area where the command post was set up, we were told to dig in. Now, in my squad, I had a new man. His name was P.T. Scott. Well, P.T. Scott was a good friend of mine. He was a black Marine. And uh, so when we were told to dig in, um, we had to uh, dig foxholes. Uh, because we didn't have sandbags or anything at that time. So we all started digging right around our area. And Scott decided that he had found the perfect spot to dig a foxhole. It was a little mound of sand. And he decided that he was going to dig straight down into this mound of sand. It made a natural parapet. A uh, parapet's a little bit of earth that sticks up all around your, your foxhole. So you can picture this little mound of sand and 
it was soft. So he dug down in the center of this little mound and we were all digging in and all of a sudden I heard this scream and I saw Scott jumping out of his foxhole. He was scrambling trying to get out of that foxhole. Come to find out that he had dug in the center of a freshly dug Vietnamese grave. Well, Scott would not go down and get his entrenching tool. I had to go down and get it. And his entrenching tool was embedded in the skull of a freshly deceased Vietnamese. They used to bury them uh, in a kind of a sitting position. Hard to describe. Anyway, that was one of our first introductions to Vietnam. Well, our first days in country, uh, we set up the CP uh, command post area. And uh, then uh, we were moved out to different areas on the uh, tactical area of responsibility. Uh, I was sent with a group of Marines to a hill that we called Catfish 2. Uh, there was Catfish 1, Catfish 2, and Catfish 3. These were on the edge of our TAOR, or Tactical Area Responsibility. When I first got to the top of that hill that we walked to, by the way, and climbed, uh, it was extremely hot that day. Uh, the ground that um, was on top of that hill where we had to dig in was like cement. I remember I laid down on the ground. We had a, a chow break where we broke out our sea rations. And as I was eating uh, my dinner, this huge dragonfly landed on my finger. Well, there were a couple of Marines sitting close by and they watched me and I started talking to this dragonfly. The little creature turned its head like it was listening to me. And I was holding a little conversation with it, you know, like saying, uh, oh, what are you doing here in Vietnam? Uh, were you born here or something? Uh, I wouldn't be here, but didn't have to be. And I was just talking to it like that. And every time I would talk to it, it would turn its little head and look at me. Well, then it flew off, and I continued to finish my sea rations, and the other Marines kind of looked at me like, oh boy, he's lost it. And then a shot rang out. Of course, we grabbed our rifles and got down and, and looked out in every direction, wondering uh, if we were being hit. Then I heard this Marine screaming, and he, he was screaming, I'm going home, I'm going home. Uh, come to find out that this guy had shot himself in the foot and he was still screaming and uh, the gunny looked at him and said uh, well if you don't shut up you'll be going home in a box you know then a chopper came down and took that guy away anyway we stayed up there on that mountain and attempted to dig in and I don't remember a a lot about the very first day up there. I knew that we did did uh, dig in somewhat. We had a few sandbags. I think I think I set up that uh, Tipsy 21 on the opposite side of the hill that faced the jungle uh, to see if we could get some signals. Uh, I went back to the uh, command post and uh, Marines were going on patrol all over the place. Uh, our battalion was really spread out. Uh, the TAOR was big enough maybe for two or three battalions, but it was just made for us, so that's what we patrolled. We had what's called backyard patrols. That was uh, 
uh, by the airstrip. We watched the Seabees build that airstrip in a matter of days. I mean, a couple of days. We're not talking about a long time now. These guys worked fast. Now, our living conditions at that time were pretty poor. Uh, when it rained, we didn't have a lot of shelter. We had shelter halves and we had ponchos and we had uh, sandbags and we were dug in and all that. Uh, the Colonel had his uh, Amtrak and that was the command post. We really didn't have water to wash with. We had just enough to drink and you haven't lived till you uh, had to drink water that was seasoned with halazone tablets. We had to drop those halazone tablets in our canteens so that we could drink it without getting sick. Well, they had a water mule at the command post where we got our water from. But when we were out in the bush on Catfish 2 or other mountains, we had to find water from a different source. And I found it uh, one day in the bottom of that mountain. There was a an old Vietnamese well. I'll never forget it. It was beautiful. It was it was uh, uh, had uh, old uh, carvings of uh, oh Buddhist origin, I guess, and it was like ancient. But the well water was cool, so I'd go down the bottom of the hill. I'd drop the canteens in and fill them up full of water. And that's when the halazone tablets were really paid off because we didn't get sick. Anyway, back at the CP, um, like I said, we would go on patrol all over the place. And one time it was my turn to lead the patrol. Uh, we used to take turns as, uh, the guy that would lead the patrol, the one that would go on point, etc. Well, it was my turn to lead. So our patrol went down Route 1. And as I walked down Route 1, we noticed that there was a large group of uh, Vietnamese that were holding a meeting uh, right next to a little area called Chulai New Life Hamlets. Uh, this was a, a new construction that the CBs built for the Vietnamese refugees that had to leave their villages. Anyway, when we got to this area where the meeting was, it was starting to get dark. And I called back uh, to uh, uh, the CP to ask if anybody knew um, or had um, given authority for these people to be out at night because when the sun went down, uh, that's when the war started. And we had no um, uh, information before we took that patrol that we were going to run into this large group of Vietnamese. Another thing, I had started to learn how to speak Vietnamese shortly after we got there. Uh, there was a lieutenant by the name of Tung Wee Lich. He was the battalion interpreter. And we struck up a friendship. And he taught me a lot of Vietnamese. As a matter of fact, I learned how to count, uh, which was invaluable. But hai ba ba nam sao bai tam chim mui. That's counting to 10. I still remember how to do that. I remembered other little phrases too. And I became uh, one of the, you might say, Marine interpreters uh, when it came to some things. And the Marines would come to me and say, well, what's he talking about? I'd try through my pinyin Vietnamese to um, converse with these people. And I did okay. Uh, still, like I said, we came upon this group of Vietnamese sitting around uh, at night or in the late evening. And uh, I sent 
Don Johnson and a couple other Marines around um, the area to kind of check out behind these guys. And Don Johnson came up with two shotguns and a rifle. Well, they weren't supposed to have weapons. They weren't uh, popular forces. They weren't Arvin troops. And that meant they could have been a Viet Cong. So I captured them, captured every doggone one of them. All the ones that were sitting in that little um, meeting and took them up on the road. I, I called uh, the CP, they called regiment. Regiment didn't know anything about it. So I was ordered to bring them back. Now what I wanted to do was bring them back alive and not have to shoot anybody in the process. By the way, my patrol was made up of 10 of us. There must have been um, maybe 30, 40 of those guys. And I captured every one of them and the 10 of us walked them back to the CP area where we had interpreters and other folks that could talk to them. Uh, there was a POW compound set up right across the road uh, from where we were. And when we got them back, uh, I turned them over to these people, uh, people that ran that POW compound. And um, then our patrol was finished that night. Well, later on, I heard that uh, there were some Viet Cong within that bunch of Vietnamese that I'd captured. I don't know, maybe five or six. And the colonel, uh, put out the word that I was going to receive a Bronze Star for uh, that action. Well, uh, we hit the rack, and the next morning I woke up, and Colonel sent word for me and those 10 Marines to uh, go on long-range patrol. He was getting us out of the area because, you see, what we had done was captured the entire police force, the fire department, the mayor and his son, along with those other uh, Viet Cong. And uh, regiment wasn't too happy about it, so they were coming after me. <laughs> but they never did catch me. They would have to go way deep in the jungle to find me. And anyway, that was one incident that happened. And um, then uh, later on, uh, Colonel Fisher I had to go into uh, Anton, which is a village uh, down Route 1 that uh, was close to this bridge, or contained this bridge. It was called the Anton Bridge. And he had to talk to the uh, village chief down there. So he grabbed me and Don Johnson as his bodyguards, actually. And we hopped in the Jeep and went with him uh, to Anton. While we were in Anton, of course, the colonel had his meeting. And after his meeting, he asked us if uh, uh, we wanted to stay around for a little bit, and kind of like on liberty. Well, John and I decided, yeah, that would be great, and we'll just walk back, you know. We weren't too afraid of anything at that time. And uh, it was during the day, so we had all day to walk back and, you know, kind of enjoy ourselves in Anton. And what we decided to do was get haircuts. You see, we hadn't had a haircut uh, from the time we left the ship to then. So John and I, uh, me and my pigeon Vietnamese, found a barber, went inside, and I said, John, you go first. He said, okay. So he sat down in the chair, and the barber breaks out a straight razor and he proceeds to cut the hair out of the nose of Don Johnson. Well, when I saw him with his straight razor, I pulled my rifle and uh, put around in the chamber and held it on this guy. And I told John, I said, John, when he's done with you, you hold the rifle for me. He said, okay. <laughs> well, the barber was a little nervous, but he did cut our hair. Uh, that was another little funny thing that happened there. Uh, there were a lot of things that happened, uh, of course, during this time. And by the way, 
because of the rain and the heat and the fact that we couldn't wash up, um, our clothes started to rot off, literally. Uh, I remember having to tie my boots on. See, they were made out of leather. They weren't the, the kind they issued later on, you know, with the um, cloth on the sides and all that uh, fancy stuff in the sole to keep you from uh, getting stabbed by a panji stick if you stepped on it. Uh, you know, they had they had little metal inserts in the bottom of the soles. That was later on. But we just had our normal leather boots that did not last long in Vietnam. And so our clothes started to rot off. And we were hoping we would get resupplied or something. And um, because our living conditions were so bad, I mean, we were living in shelters and and in the ground, and it was rather miserable. And this this went on for a few months. Well, finally, I got wind that the sea bees had made hardback uh, shelters for themselves in July. And the tents that they had used were in storage. So the scouts decided that we were going to uh, get a six by, and that's, that's a big truck, and uh, go down and, oh, repurpose those tents. That's exactly what we did. We drove right up to their compound and got out and loaded those tents. Didn't ask anybody or sign for anything we just loaded the tents on the uh, six by and i got um, a tent for the command post and i got a, a fly tent for the uh, mess hall which we didn't have and um uh, we got uh, tents for uh, supply and a, a tent for the scouts and we were in tall cotton before we got back and we got all the all the uh, poles and everything we needed to uh, put them up when we got back to the CP, uh, the colonel said he was he was real happy to see that we had confiscated this these tents from the Navy. Uh, but all he said was, uh, "Well, change the USN that's stenciled on the side of the tent to USMC." So we found a way of doing that. Anyway, for a while, that's what we lived in. Uh, in that command post area in it. And uh, I remember when it rained real hard, we would run outside and take our soap and wash up in the rain and use the rain like a shower because it came down real hard. Uh, the only problem with that uh, was that when it stopped raining and you were still soapy, uh, that was rather uncomfortable. I got to be pretty good at uh, cooking sea rations uh, I experimented with different ways of cooking them and, and you know, uh, melting the cheese over stuff and making s'mores, kind of. Uh, melting the uh, that chocolate bar in, into the pound cake and, and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, I took the pound cake and, and I would puncture holes in the uh, top of the can. Didn't open it, just punctured some holes in there and poured uh, some water in there and put it on the the um, stove that I'd made and it would steam that pound cake and I swear it tasted like fresh steamed or fresh baked pound cake when we finally ate it. Anyway, I learned all kinds of little things like that. As a matter of fact, I still have a sea ration can opener that I carry with me all the time. I learned not to be without one of those, and I still carry one. These 50 some years later, it's held on my um, key ring with a, a grenade ring uh, that holds the pin uh, that pulls out and arms the grenade.
one time I was on a, a routine patrol in the, at the backyard and um, in the morning when we broke up the ambush I saw a Vietnamese uh, get his bike out of the bushes and start to go away. Of course, I hollered at him, lie, die, lie, die, which means come here. And he heard me and looked around and decided that discretion was a better part of valor and that he could not outrun a 7.62 round that I was fixing to fly down his way. Anyway, he stopped and he smiled, grinned real big, and walked over to me with his bicycle. And I asked him, uh, what was he doing out there? In Vietnamese, of course, as I started patting him down for weapons. And while in the process of talking to him and patting him down, in his pocket was a roll of Vietnamese money that we called dong. It was buku dong. It was a lot of money. And I asked him what he was doing with all this money. And he made up some dumb excuse about going to the doctor and buying medicine for his sick mother. Well, I didn't buy that for a minute. So I captured him and we took him back to the area where they had uh, the, uh, the POW compound and other interpreters that could speak a whole lot better than me. And come to find out, this guy was a paymaster for the Viet Cong in his area. Well, that month they didn't get paid. Well, when the colonel found out about this, he uh, told me that, uh, or issued a, a special pass for me to go on one of the first R&Rs. Uh, they had a flight going out to Hong Kong. Well, for one reason or another, I decided I really didn't want to go. I mean, we'd, we'd been there a few months, but I didn't want to go to Hong Kong. And a friend of mine that worked in supply said, Oh, hey, can, you know, can, can I take your pass? Well, it was a pass to board a, a plane, and he had some time off. I said, sure. So I gave him my pass. And sure enough, he flew out and went to Hong Kong. Well, it was a couple of weeks later, I got word that the plane that this guy was flying on, coming back from Hong Kong, had gone into the Hong Kong Harbor and everyone on board was killed. We had a really fine chaplain in 2-4 at that time. And I had another really good friend of mine that was the chaplain's assistant. After that incident, I talked to the chaplain for a while. He, he was a Catholic chaplain. I, I was a Lutheran, but it didn't matter. He would uh, also, from time to time, when I came off patrol and visit my buddy who was his assistant, he'd give me a little glass of wine, not for communion, just to drink. And uh, I remember one time he shared a story with me after he came back from Anton. A uh, young Marine was um, playing with some Vietnamese children down by the bridge, you know, just, just playing around. And this Marine say, UVC. And the children would say, no, UVC. Well, this guy said, me VC? And they say, yeah, you VC, you VC. And so he took out his 45 and not meaning to, blew his brains out. It was a gesture. He, he, I don't think he knew that there was a round in the chamber, but he pulled the trigger. And that's why the chaplain had, had to go to uh, um, Anton that day to give him the last rites. He told me about that when he got back. Another incident that I was almost involved in uh, happened right around that time as well. Uh, there was a, a six spy that had picked up some Marines to go to the beach 
uh, for a swim call. And I wanted to go, but there wasn't any more room on this six by. So I said, okay, you know, I'll wait. And uh, the last Marine that got on that six by uh, had, uh, you know, his rifle, cartridge belt, helmet and everything. And there was a hand grenade that was stuck in his cartridge belt. Well, when the, the truck got down by the beach, I guess they hit a pothole or something. But somehow this guy's grenade fell out of his belt. The pin was pulled. And most of the guys in the back of that six by were killed. And then there was another time when a young Marine lieutenant uh, had taken a patrol, set up what's called an L-shaped ambush, and he decided that he was going to check his ambush. Now, one of the things you don't do after you set up an ambush is uh, leave the ambush area. But he decided he was gonna check it out, make sure his Marines are in place. It was dark. He and his, he took his radio man with him, and he walked down the trail and walked into his own ambush, and both of them were killed 